Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Lunch and Learn hosted by the Field Center for Entrepreneurship at Baruch. Um, the Center for Entrepreneurship is a multifaceted division that offers, offer, offers a variety of services and programming for entrepreneurial thinking people. You don't necessarily have to be an entrepreneur, but your line of thinking, your mindset is an entrepreneurial world. And so we cater to you. We offer free workshops, uh, seminars, prototyping programs, counseling, and so much more through our SBDC, our CUNY Startup Program, Maker Hub Program. And we also offer degree programs in entrepreneurship. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're gonna keep everybody on mute keep your cameras off as well. Um, this session is being recorded. And so just for your own privacy as well, I just wanna make sure that um, we're, we're capturing uh, our speaker. I'm here as well. And we'll take all our questions at the end. I'll open up the chat and I will moderate from there. So we'll just go ahead and move forward with our session today. Today's session, Financial Independence on a College Student's Budget, Strategies for Raising Capital and Building Your Own Banking System. This is being presented by my good friend, Earl Coe. Earl is an engineer, he's an investor, an entrepreneur, and an educator. While as an undergrad at NYU Tandon School of Engineering, he co-founded the Hack NYU Hackathon, which has now grown to over 600 participants every year. His interests and expertise lie in topics, in topics encompassing environmental sustainability, rapid prototyping, mixed reality, cryptocurrencies, travel hacking, and real estate investing. I know these things because he's taught me some of it, this as well. Uh, these interests led him to pursue a career revolving around entrepreneurship, and his aim is to develop technology that helps humanity individually and collectively reach our full potential. Thank you so much, Earl, for being here with us and for sharing what you know. Um, I know this is going to be a very lively session with you and, and, and as your friend, thank you so much for giving your time to us. So I appreciate it. Feel free to take it away. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Marlene. And I have some good news to share. So good news is that I know why you're broke, okay? So I've got some bad news later on, <laughs> but let's start there. Here's how the session will run. This is somewhat broken up into two segments in which we'll do a quick 30 minute session on a banking strategy called Velocity Banking where we'll, we'll be able to save money on interest from the banks. Then we'll do a short Q&A session. It might run 15 minutes, maybe we'll shorten it. Uh, depending on the feedback that I'm receiving. And then following that, I'll break into a second segment of this workshop. Where we'll go into that, a 30 minute session on raising private money. And that means finding money that you can use to invest in yourself, invest in your education, invest in real estate, whatever you wanna do with using none of your own money. And I'll show you how to do that. You don't need any fancy skills, be, uh, Prior to this workshop, you just need to know basic arithmetic, so math and algebra, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> By the end of the session, participants will, be, uh, will understand uh, the difference between amortized loans and lines of credit and the pros and cons of each. They'll learn how not all interest rates are created equal and, and we'll discover sources of capital that we'll use to invest in our businesses uh, and our real estate or whatever you want to invest that money with, really. So I know why you're broke. But first, the mindset. Marlene has mentioned a little bit of that entrepreneurial mind, mindset. And for a, lot of, for a lot of folks, it's really the first thing that's stopping us from pursuing the change we want to see in ourselves and in the world. So Jim Rohn, one of my mentors, Jim Rohn says, if you will change, everything will change for you. Okay, that means the first thing that has to change is your mindset. So what I've learned over the years is that most people live a life of default rather than by design. A life of default looks somewhat like this. A third of your income goes towards interest. A third of your income goes towards taxes, leaving only a third for your lifestyle. And that includes your rent, your mortgage, your food, transportation, shelter, all of that. But what I wanna show you is how to flip the game 
on both of these large chunks so that we dedicate 80% of our income towards our lifestyle and leave only 10% towards interest and taxes. And I wanna to focus today on the interest segment. We might not have, we probably don't have time for taxes, but I do have additional slides at the end of this PowerPoint that go into that. So if there's for some reason some time, we can dive a little bit into that. But we'll focus on the orange segment here that is reducing the amount of interest that we pay to the banks. Okay, so a little bit about me, um, as Marlene has already mentioned, Oh, she actually already read it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and skip through that. <laughs> but I do have a day job as well as uh, as well as a side hustles and investments and businesses that I operate. So if you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant, I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, I'm I've got a little bit one of each of the four quadrants there. Okay. Before I proceed, uh, I want it to be, <laughs> here's a little disclaimer, asterisk, bold actually, bold asterisk. I'm not licensed. I have no specific licenses in anything to do anything with finances, taxes, anything, none of that. I'm just sharing what I've learned from the ones who have the licenses, from the professionals who do have that. So I'm not offering any specific counsel. All, uh, the only license I have is a, driving, is a driver's license. <laughs> okay, so... I could read all this out loud, but it's right there. <laughs> I recommend you engage the services of professionals in making decisions that have legal impact, especially financial decisions. Don't sue me, bro. <laughs> okay, so what do these people have in common? Oh yeah, we have a whole mute thing, so I'll perhaps I'll just answer for you. Um, but if you look at the this slide of six individuals, yeah, you'll say, oh, these are just billionaires. But what they actually, what I actually wanted to highlight in what they have in common is that they did not inherit their wealth. You know, this is like new money rich, not old money rich. And what I've learned is that wealthy people, wealthy people have a different mindset, right? So the, there's, the employee mindset is that there is only two currencies, time and money. And yet, while we all know, or we might all know, that time is more valuable, we act as if money is more valuable, which means there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance there. We know for sure, as a fact that time is more valuable, it's a non-renewable resource, we can always get more money. If there's a will, there's a way. But we go through our life chasing money as if it's the only thing that matters. Well, what I've learned is that the wealthy, like the billionaires that we saw, have a different mindset. They see five different currencies, time, knowledge, relationships, credit, and money. And credit is kind of like the rela your relationship with money and your relationship with the banks. So relationships at credit are somewhat similar. And then also similarly, credit and money are somewhat similar because as we'll see today, we can kind of treat credit as if it is money. So most importantly, this is the order. Time is most valuable, knowledge secondarily, our relationships, credit and money. And you don't need all five of these, you just need you know, two or three. And if you bring two or three to the table, the others will naturally come. So money is actually the least important. We've also been taught over the years that we should grow our nest egg. We should, have, we should say, continue to save in our savings account, in our retirement accounts, and build this nest egg so that at some point in the very distant future, we might be able to retire and live off of that egg. While wealthy people figured, why not just buy the chicken that lays the eggs, right? And therefore, you don't need this massive amount of cash hoarded in your retirement accounts and savings account in order to become financially independent however that definition may be. So to have that wealthy mindset, think about the golden goose that lays the, the goose that, gave, that lays the golden eggs, not necessarily the eggs themselves. So Robert Kiyosaki had this cash flow quadrant concept that is a breakout between the left, quadrant, the left side and the right side, where the, on the left side, we have the employee and the self-employed, and on the right side, we have business owners and investors. On the left side, we trade time for money. 
even if you have a small business that you run, chances are, unless you have systems in place, you're working in your business rather than on your business. So even if you're self-employed, you're still trading time for money. And of course, if you are an employee, as I am, by choice, <laughs> you're trading time for money towards a company that you have no ownership of, or maybe you have very little ownership of when it comes to shares. On the flip side, you have business owners and investors. And business owners operate use systems to operate their businesses. They don't necessarily trade time for money. The business can continue to run with or without active involvement of that business owner, okay? They own a system and people and systems and technology work for them. So the leverage is there with the systems that are, that are being built. As an investor, you don't necessarily have to have systems or people even, you just make money work for money. So this is time decoupled income, not dependent on your presence, not, you don't even necessarily have to work on it or in it, you just let the money roll. So the money works for you rather than time working for you. So what I've learned is that the wealthy are generally, most commonly business owners and real estate investors. They might also invest in the stock market, equities, cryptocurrencies, whatever. But for the most part, most wealthy people have some sort of real estate. And it's not just their home either. It's real estate that generates income. It's real estate that's tied to a business. Because your home is not an asset, it's a liability. The financial definition of an asset is something that makes money for you. And a liability is something that takes money from you. So if it costs money to hold that thing, I would not necessarily call it an asset. For example, your car, it costs money to hold that thing. It doesn't even appreciate in value, it depreciates. So that's absolutely not necessarily an asset, even if you know on their bank forms it asks, list all your assets. <laughs> you can't put your car on there, but financially, it's not technically an asset. And neither is your own house that you live in. Now, if you live in your house and you rent it out, that then we can start talking about what an asset looks like. So there's five pillars of wealth, the taxes, banking, business, real estate, and education. What we're gonna focus today is on the banking aspect, right? Another disclaimer, this is a hypothetical example to show how this principle works. It's intended to be general information. Real estate investment results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each opportunity and individual circumstance. Circumstance, this hypo hypothetical example does not guarantee or predict a similar result in any past, present, or future real estate investment opportunity. Each real estate investment result is as unique as the real estate itself. So unless you've got the exact same address and you know the exact same circumstances, the deals, the banks, everything, you're not going to be able to necessarily replicate this. But you can take the, the, the lessons that you learn from this and apply it towards your own goals and dreams. So how do we buy a house as a college student? It might be a little bit trickier in New York City, but I did do it, uh, but I didn't buy in New York City. I bought outside of New York City. So let's go into the banking world for a little bit. When you've got this money coming in, let's just say and, uh, these are average numbers, median numbers across the US taken from nerdwallet.com. The average American will may earn $5,000 on a monthly basis. $60,000 median income. And we'll just ignore taxes for a bit for now, right? We're just focusing on the banking. What happens to that money? The bank, the banks teach us to put it into our CNS, our checking and savings accounts. Have you ever wondered why we do that? Other than the bank said so? Because the bank's gonna tell you what they want you to do, right? What makes them more money? So from there, we'll take our money. We will probably split it up into a mortgage uh, or rent, car, credit card payments, lifestyle. Again, these are average numbers uh, for the average American. Your circumstances are abs absolutely going to be different. So I'm gonna put a name to, to one of these people. Uh, let's, I, can just see, I can just see Catherine on my screen. So this is Catherine's account. <laughs> So Catherine has $5,000 coming in. Most of that comes out and then the rest of it goes to savings, $1,400, leaving 5,000 in, 5,000 out, leaving nothing at the end of the month. 
So a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. A lot of them don't, don't even have savings, right? So there's a lot more month at the end of your money <laughs> instead of money at the end of your month. But first, let's consider this. Is this a true statement? Everyone's on mute, so I'm gonna answer for you. <laughs> it is not a true statement. Well, it depends. I, I don't think, I think the correct answer would be not enough information, right? How about now? This is absolutely not a true statement because now we have additional information that states this particular number tied to this particular set of units is not accurate with this statement. How about now? You got 32 degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees Celsius. Most people, and they should, would say that this is a true statement, and it is. Which one's hotter? One degree Celsius. And how would you explain that to a five-year-old? Well, the way I would say it is that they're different units of measurement, right? Different rulers. You got your inches, you got your centimeters. You got the English system, the metric system. So with, with regards to the way we measure most things in life, we have enough information or that at least we can find out what information we have. But when it comes to interest rates, what you see on the term sheet is not necessarily you know, the full picture. So when you look, when you look at interest rates, 21% versus 6%, which one's hotter? I'd say again that you don't have enough information because unlike the temperatures where we have a second unit, Fahrenheit or Celsius, this percent sign is like a degree sign. It doesn't really tell you the full picture. So what kind of percent, right? So going back to Catherine's bank statements, <laughs> money comes in, money comes out, ending with nothing. On the right side, Catherine happens to have a lot of amortized loans. Let's say they have a house, they have a car, and on the left, whoa, skip too much. On the left side, we have simple interest lines of credit. And those are credit cards, home equity lines of credit, other kinds of revolving debt. And the difference is, is you can see is in the arrows, money goes in and out of lines of credit while money only goes out and then back in once you pay it off over time on amortized loans. Have you ever looked at a mortgage disclosure? Or you look at the mortgage, What's the root word of mort? Oh, mortgage. Oh, it's mort. I gave it away. It's the root word of mortgage is mort. That, that's Latin for death. And gage or G-A-G-E -E, is also derived from the word wage, gauge, wage. It means a, a pledge or a promise. So you've got a 30-year debt promise in order to buy a house. And that's what we were set up in the US. And they actually do things a little differently in Australia. And this is where some of the strategy comes from. And um, so what we do is, what we do is we buy, we, we buy, we get, obtain 30 year mortgages with the bank in order to buy real estate or cars, five year mortgages, not mortgage, but amortized loans. And you'll see again in the uh, word amortized, the root word is mort to your death. <laughs> So here's what a typical interest schedule looks like when it comes to an amortized loan. This is the amortization schedule. You can look up a standard one, but let's say we have a mortgage of approximately, what was the number there? It's $200,000. We have a $1,200 a month interest at 6%. Now, nowadays we can get even lower amortized loan interest because the feds have made it such that we can get it as low as two or 3%. But let's just say 6% because that's what standard used to be. So when you look at the amortization schedule, you'll see that the, for the first five, 10 years, the majority of your $1,200 a month payment actually goes to the, to, the print, to the interest rather than the principal. It's not until year 20 that the payments towards the interest, your $1,200 payment, 600 of which goes to your principal and 600 goes to interest. So, what happens is that for the majority of the first few years of our, of our mortgage on your house, you pay a lot of interest, right? And then what do people do after, I don't know, three, four, five years? A lot of people actually end up refinancing. 
And there are reasons, financial strategic reasons to refinance, especially if you're going from 6% amortized to two and a half or 3%. But for the most part, they'll just refinance for a little bit of extra uh, smaller mortgage payment. But what happens when they do that is they actually end up restarting the debt. So instead of you a 30 year mortgage, now you end up uh, with a 35 year mortgage or a 40 year mortgage, further compounding the remaining balance. If you wanted to pay a principal amount of $1,200 to kind of fast forward your schedule, you can make extra payments, of course. That's what a basic strategy is to fast forward your mortgage. You can make extra payments. The problem with making extra payments is that, you know, one month you might have extra money, but then the next month you're like, oh, I need that money back. You can't go to call the bank and say, hey, uh, can I undo, undo that extra payment that I did? They're going to say no, you know, just continue to pay it off as agreed. So you're screwed once you make that payment and you can't pull it back out. So that's a bit of a downside with regards to making extra payment. But if you wanted to make $12,000 $12, of, uh, of payment towards the principal only, you would have to make 48 payments of $1,200 a month if you're following the regular schedule that's given to you, that's set to you by the bank. Along the way, you've made $45,000 in interest payments. So right away, we can see that the first four years or 48 months of payments already, already cost you $45,000 in interest. So loans are principal and interest and you lose your cash flow once you make those payments. When it comes to lines of credit, they're revolving, they're two-way streets. And they are simple interest in that they're not compounded over 30 years, five years or whatever. It's just whatever the balance is, the average daily balance of your line of credit at that day is what the interest is. And it only compounds once a month. Oh, hello, Natalie. Natalie. Thanks for circling my screen. That's okay. <laughs> and the principal, most importantly, the principal is liquid. Meaning if you put the money in like a credit card, you make that payment, you can pull that money right back out and you use it again, right? So you can, it's a two-way street. So that's, it's, you know, that's the most powerful aspect of this. Oh, I can't get rid of that line eraser. I cannot, I don't have my eraser button hidden. Nope, I think that worked. Yeah, okay, great. Right. So line, rule number one, lines are better than loans. And rule number two, employee mindset says cash is currency. The, your money comes in and you, it goes right back out. Well, a wealthy mindset will treat cash as velocity, meaning how the more cash you have coming in, the faster you can do this. And leverage or debt is what you use to actually spend with or more accurately redeploy your capital. So we'll use debt or leverage as the currency and cash as the velocity, okay? So we're gonna change this up a little bit. So Catherine, instead of uh, putting all our money into checking and savings, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take $5,000 in and we're gonna redeploy all of it at the line of credit. Let's say we just had a credit card with an average balance of $12,000 and a $600 a month payment. We're gonna shove all of our income to wipe out that balance leaving you with you know, six uh, extra cash flow because you, that $600 minimum payment goes away. And we're also gonna apply your savings to it. So we're actually gonna put the savings to work because on a savings account, you probably only make 1% if you're at best 1% a year uh, on your savings account. And that's if you have a, you know, Ally Bank or you know, Web Bank or some other fancy bank. But most banks actually pay 0.01% or less. They pay nothing. So we're gonna redeploy our savings and, our, and, our, and, and get rid of our credit card uh, monthly bill by applying all of our income towards that credit card. Now the balance used to be $12,000. Now, the first, of the, the first day of the month, it's down to $7,000 because we put $5,000 in. Of course we have expenses, but we had no money in our bank account because we got rid of all of it. <laughs> uh, so our expenses are gonna come out of that line of credit. If you, need to pay, if you need to pay rent and such using your credit card, there are tools online that allow you to do that. And there's also strategies that allow you to do that um, that I've learned over the years of you know, my journey as a travel hacker <laughs> and uh, allowing myself to travel for free on the bank's dime. So there are ways to pay your mortgage and pay your rent using your credit card. So we're gonna do that. At the end of the month, we end up with expenses, but 
assuming we had a savings left over anyway, that savings is now trapped in the equity and the equity, well, the equity of the credit card in the limits, in the available limits. The nice thing is that all along the way, from the first of the month to the last day of the month, before your rent payment is due, your balance is super low. So we're actually saving interest on every single day that the balance is low, all right? So that's where a lot of the power is on in lines of credit. Oh, we do, so we do that over and over and over and over again. Six months later, you pay it off. All you needed was $2,000 no, $2, in extra cash flow, meaning money you didn't spend. And uh, in a course of six months, $12,000 gets reduced to zero. What happens when you lower your balances is that you typically you can ask, you can call your bank or the bank calls you or sends you a letter that says you got a credit limit increase. So now you've got more money to play with. Your new limit used to be, your limit used to be to $15,000. Now you got $25,000. These are just examples. I've had credit limit increases myself before. I'm not sure if you have, but uh, I'm sure, you know, especially nowadays, if you have, if you show as a, as a responsible borrower, to the banks, they will give you a credit limit increase. Okay, so we've got rid of our credit card payments and we got rid of our savings because we paid off the card. Let's do this. What if we took our car, the balance of our car, the balance of our house, whatever, and make that $12,000 principal only payment towards, let's just say the house, because we had initially calculated that it took 48 months and $45,000 in interest to pay $12,000 in principal towards the house. So what if we just move that debt into this kind of debt, right? We're gonna you know, pay off $12,000 of the house with a credit card. It sounds insane, but only if you consider that you're not doing this velocity. So if you're not doing this, it would be insane because your credit card interest uh, in our example is 21%. And if you left that balance uh, to season there and really compound over the, the one year, you'll pay 21% versus the 6%. But the point is to not let that balance compound and season. The point is to continue to reduce that balance as quickly as possible. Of course, there's going to be interest. And if you use this strategy with, in, in conjunction with 0% APR credit cards, uh, even business cards that don't show on your credit report, then it's all the more powerful. But let's just say you have a standard credit card that you know there is no 0% interest promo on it. Then it's going to cost you 21% interest or 25 or it doesn't really matter at this point um, over six months because we'll pay it off. So that's just 1,260 in, in the course of six months. It's actually less than that because all along the way, the daily balance decreases, right? So we're just, you know, just taking an average 21% over two. So half the year costs us this much. The same goal of paying $12,000 principal on your regular you know, mortgage payments over the course of four years will cost you $45,000 in interest. So all of, you know, right away, we can see where the, where the savings lie. So we do that, do it again, do it again, do it again, until you pay off your 30-year mortgage in a matter of three, four, five years, maybe more, but not 30 years. So now you've done that, you've freed up your cash flow further because you got rid of your mortgage payment. Now you've got this much cash flow. The more, uh, as a, uh, to reiterate, the more cash you have, the faster you can do this, right? So more velocity. So now instead of paying off you know, your car or your house in six months, now it takes less. It takes fewer months and now you pay off the car. And sometimes you might want to pay in different order. I, I generally do a you know order of decreasing interest rates, decreasing amortized loan interest rates. So my strategy personally is to free up as much of my credit limits as possible and then use the credit limits to free up or to get rid of the loans in decreasing order of interest rates, in of amortized interest rates. So I'll pay off my say 6% personal loan versus before I'll pay off my 4% mortgage. But it also matters what the balance is, right? And uh, when it comes to a, a house, the nice thing about the house is that you can get what's called a home equity line of credit. So as you pay off the balance of the mortgage, you can actually increase your credit limit attached to that same house. So you can have both. So now you got rid of all your debt. Congratulations. Except you're supposed to pay off your debt. <laughs> Why should we con congratulate you? It's literally your job. <laughs> That's what you promised the banks. 
So it's like, you know, congratulations, you changed your baby's diaper. <laughs> Let's take it to the next level, okay? Disclaimer again, same thing. This is hypothetical. Numbers are made up. Well, they use averages. I mentioned the home equity line of credit. So now we paid off our house. It's worth $200,000. Maybe it's worth a little bit more. Let's say we borrow $200,000 against that. And unless we use that amount, what we just did is open a $200,000 limit, like a credit card tied to the value of the house, right? So as the value of your house increases, your credit limit increases automatically. Or maybe you have to call the bank to get it to increase manually. But the point is that as you pay down your mortgage and you increase the value of the house, you got more cash to pay with, play with. And now you have basically your own banking system. We got rid of debt. We're actually going to go towards building more assets. And you, can, you don't necessarily have to get rid of all your debt just so you can jump in. I went straight into jumping into buying assets using little to none of my own money. So a friend of mine uh, obtained a $30,000 limit from a credit card and he did a similar thing. So he, what he actually did is pay off his car using the credit card completely and then, and then paid off a little bit of their personal loans, other kinds of debt and a little bit of their mortgage towards that balance. And then they did this, followed that strategy, all the money goes in, all the money comes out or expenses come out and pay it off in a matter of 10 months. Okay, that was, that was him, that was just, he had a $30,000 limit and that's what he could do. And then what he then, what then, what he then used is he used his credit card, a $30,000 limit on a credit card as a down payment on, towards a down payment on a duplex. So he bought a house with a credit card. <laughs> and I've done a similar strategy myself um, using a 0% APR credit card that allowed it to be really powerful and then, and then paid it back. It was $15,000 uh, towards a down payment. I needed, I needed um, $35,000 total. So I had to put a little bit of cash personally, but had I known then what I know now, I would not have done that. I would not have put in my, my own savings. I would have kept my money in my own savings or invested in other assets, but that's what I did. So we kind of went through that in brief details, the tip of the iceberg. And most people are like, I don't know what the heck just happened. I'm crying. I don't know what's going on. So that's why we're going to go into a Q&A session for a little bit. But other people are like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's really cool. Show me more. All right. So you might be one of these. And uh, I invite you to download the calculator at this link earlyrewirement.com slash calculator. Download the free calculator. It's a Google sheet. You can actually just make a copy uh, and put it into your own Google Drive folder. And that calculator is a combination velocity banking calculator that I didn't make, but it, uh, as well as a rental property cash flow analysis that I did make. There are instructions in that calculator uh, to an extent, but a little bit of the instructions is also in you know, what you learned today. And so once you download that, you'll be able to see on a day by day basis in the spreadsheet, what happens to the, the principal balance, the interest balance, you know, your line of credit balances and how that works based on your situation and your numbers and your loans and lines of credit that you have available and their interest rates. So download that. And I'm going to open the floor up for questions for this first part. Um, so I'm having trouble getting my chat up. So Victoria, can you open up the chat so people could put questions and wait, no, I still can't. If you want me to jump to previous slides, I can do that as well. Yeah, and Earl, go ahead and if you see questions coming in the chat, you can take them because I now I can't yeah. see anything in there. I, I don't see anything yet. Yeah. Chat is up. Thanks, Tim. There you go. Oh, hey, Tim. Did, did did that make sense to anyone or is it just completely over your head? It's possible that it's completely over your head. I tried to go as low as possible. So I will jump in and say that Earl has spent a considerable amount of time teaching me some of this and a lot of it does go over my head. But I think the visuals that have come through this presentation actually helped a little bit. So I know that there is probably some ways, and I know my husband's talked to you about this too, about um, how we're gonna utilize some of these strategies to like get our mortgage, we actually just refinance and like sort of probably push some of our mortgage payments to credit cards 
um, because we have enough to probably start doing this a little bit more each month. I see some questions coming in. Yes. Yes, and uh, yeah, to Marlene's point, it's you're not increasing your debt. You're just moving it from one vehicle to another. You're moving it from your mortgage to your credit card, and then you're paying it off quickly, right? Um, it, it's not like go get more debt. Uh, I did say go get more debt once you take the, once you uh, free up your credit lines and you use that to buy more houses. Yeah, go get more debt. <laughs> but these houses pay themselves off using incomes because we're treating them like businesses. And you know, I didn't really go too far into you know the different aspects of real estate investing. Uh, so, so questions. Yep. Just uh, repeat the question for everyone yes. and for the audience. Of so Melanie asks, essentially the main takeaway is that if we have lines of credit and student loans, we should pay off the loans with a chunk of our credit line and pay off the loan that way. And I would say that, that if that is your goal, then yes, absolutely. But everyone's goal is going, to be, is going to be different. For me, for example, I wanted to buy houses before I wanted to pay off my student loans. So I'd much rather take 30 grand and go buy a house uh, and make, I don't know, 20, 30, 40% uh, in returns of the investment than save 3.74% APR on my, on my student loans. So it really depends on what your student loan interest rates are and also what your priorities and goals are. For me, I mean, those student loans are going to be uh, for me, are going to be one of the last things I'm going to pay off because, for example, uh, my mortgage is at 4.8%, but my student loans at 3.4%. I'd rather pay off the mortgage, free up a credit line, and then put the student loans onto that mortgage. So it'll be one of the last things I'll pay. So that's just me personally, but everyone's going to be a little bit different. And you know, if your goal is like, hey, I just want to get rid of these student loans, I want, I don't want them off my back. I, I want them off my back. Then, then yeah, do do it that way. Um, personally, though. What are they gonna do? Take away my, take away my degree. <laughs> they can take my house. They can take my car. They can't take my degree. You already learned it. <laughs> Unsecured debt, very powerful. Don't tell the banks that. Well, they know it already. <laughs> we, uh, Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, we, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel. Actually, we can. Uh, you will get access to this presentation by email. Marlene will send it over to you guys. Travis, miss the first half of this meeting. Where can you find this recording? Marlene will also send that recording out along with the slides. Good job, Marlene. <laughs> For clarification, you would pay the principal of your house from using the credit lines and then pay your credit card off quickly. Yes, yes, Asia, that is exactly what this strategy entails. Melanie says, makes sense. Thank you, I understand. Natalie says, sorry about the red drawing. Oh, <laughs> that's no, no problem there. So does this make sense to everyone? I hope so. Come off mute if you have questions. Yeah, Clarification on or anything like that. That's just one tip of the iceberg strategy. There, you know, I, I took this course, and that specific class alone was like, well, I actually only watched the first half, and it was like six hours. And there's a second half that I haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> so, uh, and you go, you go way insane. What you actually do in that second half is you take the it's like advanced velocity banking. Rather than paying it off in chunks using a credit credit line, you end up replacing the entire mortgage in one fell swoop. And then you pay that off. And sometimes it makes sense. And so other times, mathematically, it doesn't. You end up actually paying more interest. But in both cases, you pay it off quicker. It's just a matter of, do we chunk it out in pieces? You know, 12,000 at a time, 1,000 at a time. Maybe not 1,000, that's too low. 5,000 5, at a time. Depends, right? Or do we pay it off completely? So it depends on the balance. For example, a car loan, yeah, we'll take $5,000 and wipe it off completely. But a mortgage, probably not. Right. And how fast do you want to do that? It's all dependent on your cash flow. So if you only have, I don't know, 500 a month in that, that normally would have gone in your savings, you probably don't want to chunk uh, that much all at once. How would you recommend a college student to start, especially if you don't have a steady income? Yeah, that's the main point of this presentation, right? Is the, we'll actually go over that in the second half here. But essentially, we're going to go in with none of our own money, right? We're gonna, let's say, reduce our rent or pay it off or, or replace it entirely or arbitrage it where rents from another place is paying your rents. That's a little bit of what I did in the past. But, uh, and you also don't need your own credit. So you can use, there's strategies where you can use other people's money and, and other people's credit in order to do this. All you need is the right knowledge and the right strategies and a game plan and a business plan, right? 
get this presenter a guitar. He's a rock star. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Sorry, what course was that? It's uh, a course uh, I can introduce you uh, towards the end. Um, there, I have a Facebook group. There's tons of video resources that are also free that you can watch at your own pace. And uh, that'll go into you know some of the education that I've received. And uh, this is just some of the pieces that I, I can squeeze into an hour and a half that I'm presenting here because there's like 500 hours of it. So I can't really explain everything. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. provide all the links for the Facebook group and um, the courses that Earl is referring to as well. You'll all get yeah. all of this by email and it'll be on our website as well. Great. Uh, we are, Bob says we are utilizing 0% or low introductory interest that comes with a new line of credit. Yes, if you can, but what I also wanted to re uh, reiterate is that this strategy works even if you can't. Okay, so that means you can do this with literally any line of credit that you have available as long as you have sufficient cash flow. If you are paycheck to paycheck literally with no savings as in, you know, all your money goes in and then you have too much month at the end of your money, then <laughs> that's not going to work. It's, it, it's just not, you know, you need at least a couple hundred bucks in extra cash flow so that the, pay, the balances on the, on the credit card actually does get reduced. If you don't have extra money, then we got to work on increasing your income first. Okay. And that's where, you know, some of other strategies, increasing your income, you get a side hustle, all that. I might cover a little bit today. This recording will be accessible after the webinar. So, but I'm going to, you know, proceed. If there are no other questions, we are going to move forward. So how do we increase our income? We just talked about that. Okay. I got no money. I'm a college kid. You know, all my, if I am, if I've got a job, it all goes towards the rent. That's what happened to me. And uh, fortunately, you know, I was on scholarship, so I had very little tuition to pay, but I did have to live in New York City. At one point, we had six people in a two bedroom apartment <laughs> and you know, your typical Brooklyn apartment, they're not very big. And uh, also another point, we took, a, we took the living room and had uh, split that in half <laughs> and had three or four people living in just the living room of a New York City apartment. So I wish I knew back then what I knew now, but one way to, you know, your big, one of your biggest expenses, if you look at your cash flow statement, you just look at your, all your incomes, if any, and check out your expenses. The biggest expense is typically going to be, well, in New York City, it's probably your Metro card, <laughs> but also your rents, right? So how do we do it so that we're able to essentially live for free? Uh, one, one strategy that I've learned so far is called house hacking. And it might not be possible in New York City because you'd have to buy like a condo or something with cash. And it doesn't really make sense to do that in New York City. But if in, a, in another city, you might be able to buy a house using your credit or you know family member's credit or, or business partner's credit. Uh, and little to none of your own money. I'll show you that now. To get into a house that you live in and you also rent out the other extra rooms, right? So maximize every single idle asset, every single idle square footage in your, in your space to increase the income such that the income pays for the mortgage of the house. And we're actually going to use a mortgage because mortgages are great for acquiring properties. They're just not great for keeping them long-term. You know, they have their pros and cons. Using both really makes it a lot, really powerful. We're also going to increase our income by starting a business. And the nice thing about the business is that the IRS treats it most favorably. Small business owners are the backbone of the US economy, as the politicians say. And, and rightfully so, we'll see that the, if you look at any country's tax code, what the government wants you to do, it, it reveals itself in there. They'll punish anything they don't want you to do by charging you more taxes. And they'll reward what they do want you to do by saving you, on, saving you money on taxes. So the only way to do that is to start your own business uh, and not necessarily work for someone else. You can do both. You, know, you can have an hourly job and then you take that income and you use that, funnel that into your side hustle, start YouTube videos. There's so many ways, Etsy. At, I'm not even gonna go into that. <laughs> But when you're first starting off, you gotta be self-aware, right? You have to discover who you are and what you're good at and what you most importantly have a passion for and what you like to do. Because if you don't like to do it, your business is going to fail. Even if you, you know, 
uh, well, perhaps you could you could generate in, enough income for a short period of time. Um, and, you know, it's basically just like a job you don't like. You know, how many people go to jobs they don't like? Okay, you can start your own business that you don't like. Uh, <laughs> I prefer doing things that are fun. And your business has to have a mission and vision statement. So your mission is your short-term kind of, your, your goals, your short-term goals for your company. And you're gonna treat yourself as a company now. Okay, you are, everyone is a sole proprietor. Every, everyone in the US, if you got a social security number and ITIN, you are your own business, right? You just have to think like that. So you don't need a fancy LLC or entity or anything like that to start your own business. You can be an, in, uh, you can be an independent contractor on DoorDash, or you can be more of a sole proprietorship where you're selling stuff on eBay or Etsy or YouTube. You're going to set big, uh, and your vision is your, your dream, your 30 year goal. You know, it's what you truly want to do. Your mission is your short term, your vision is, you know, longer term. You're going to set big goals. Uh, I've, learned to set 90 year goals. So Walt Disney, he had a vision of Disneyland. He died before he even realized it. So set goals that are just too far to achieve that uh, you'll probably pass leaving it off for the next generation to fulfill. Create a vision board. What is a vision board? A vision board looks like a giant poster, put it on your wall. We're gonna break it up into three segments. It's gonna have health, wealth, and relationship goals. And for each of those three segments, you're gonna put three, you're gonna take three photos and words that you're gonna cut out of magazines or print out from the internet. And we're gonna paste them. These are your goals. They're gonna be visual. They're gonna be vivid. And you're gonna want to see that every day to remind yourself, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Health, wealth, relationships, okay? So mine looks, well, where's mine? Well, mine's on, on the wall at home. Well, my, mine looks like, you know, I have four in like one of my other categories. Mine has like four in one of the categories. It's, it's, it's loose, but just set at least a three by three grid. It doesn't have to be a grid, of course. You can make it fancy if you're into scrapbooking and such. <laughs> make it art, artistic. And importantly, most importantly, you need to have a strategy. So you need to have a game plan. You need to have step-by-step -step processes in place. You need, to have, you need to know what you don't know so that you can go out and seek that knowledge. And you have that strategy because if you jump in you know, without knowing it, then you're gonna end up going down the path of paying tuition at the School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> you take a, then you're, you know, once you got the right prerequisites, enough prerequisites that you're comfortable. At some point, you, you just can't know everything. So at some point, you know, you don't want to get stuck up in analysis paralysis where you're like, oh, I don't know if this is really the, the, the best thing. You're just going to have to take action. Just, just go in. You know, once you sufficiently prepared yourself with enough tools, knowledge, resources, you're able to take action. And you also want, you also want to realize those achievements early on, right and right away. You know, feel good and manifest fast. And that means celebrate your successes. We're gonna reflect and celebrate every step of the way. Even if it's like, oh, I learned how to do this or I finally took action on this, right? We're gonna to wanna to celebrate that because that, that happiness and motivation drives, continues self-motivating, it's self-perpetuating. It drives you. Okay, well, how do we do this without any money? <laughs> got into the meat, the meat, well, the meat, two big meats of the webinar. <laughs> find the money. There are many ways to find money that you don't have. Of course, if you have cash and personal credit, that's fantastic. Great. Money can be in the form of credit cards or money can be in the form of relationships. It's not necessarily, you know, cold, hard cash in your bank account. Your bank account could be zero and you could be doing all this stuff. As I try to do personally, I like try to keep my bank account at zero, not zero, maybe a thousand dollars, 2000, just enough to pay <laughs> to make the auto payments come through. Uh, and then everything else is redeployed, right? They're not spent, they're deployed. <laughs> just a mindset change. So we can use our cash or personal credit, but chances are we don't have that. So think about this. If you have a full-time job or you know someone who has a full-time job, salaried, they might not be salary, it might be hourly. They probably have a retirement account. It doesn't have to be your own retirement account. It could be your, it could be other people's retirement accounts. I mentioned HELOC before, home equity lines of credit. 
if you don't have a home, your parents might, <laughs> they probably have a ton of trapped equity in there. Private funding is friends, family, and fools. Your fundraising round, I'll show you that. Life insurance is another strategy <laughs> where, not strategy, is another source of, of, of cash and capital. So life insurance, it's not just any life insurance, not term life. You have to be cash value life insurance, so whole life, permanent life, universal life, those kinds of policies. And if your parents were savvy enough to have opened one up for you when you were younger, uh, and uh, or maybe they just kind of got sold an insurance plan, <laughs> they didn't have to be savvy <laughs> by some financial, invest, uh, financial advisor, aka life insurance salespeople. <laughs> no offense to life insurance salespeople, but that's what you are. <laughs> You can cut this out of the recording if you want. <laughs> Gotta have jokes sometimes. Um, but if you, if your parents were fortunate enough to actually have set up a plan for you, um, mine, my, my mom actually did set up one for me. And so, you know, I've got a small, I don't know, $1,500, $2,000 so out of my $20,000 life insurance plan that was set up when I was 10. Um, and then, you know, I've since added my own uh, permanent life policies afterwards once I learned strategies on how to really use those in conjunction with the velocity banking strategy I'm mean, like infinite banking velocity banking infinite velocity <laughs> that's one of the keywords that you can google but there's also a certain companies out there that will help you find money using your credit or other people's credit and then of course there's also business credit and that's you know, that's a whole thing where you don't have to use your credit or anyone's credit. You actually are going to use, you're going to build an entity, a separate entity's credit. So an LLC that you might be the sole owner of, but that LLC has its own credit that, you know, you don't have to personally guarantee or anything, but you have to do it right. It's a fairly lengthy process. It takes some time and some skills as well. So going through personal and business credit cards, I mentioned business credit, but these business cards that I'm specifically talking about are, uh, they have a personal guarantee in that if you default, the bank can and will come after you personally. The later kind of business credit, they can't, they're non-recourse, they can't come after you at all. But let's, we gotta start somewhere. We can start with just opening credit cards and lines of credit that uh, and leverage 0% ones. For example, I, I'm a big fan of Chase because they have some of the best rewards out there for, for free travel, but they also have some of the best business cards out there that provide 0% APR for 12 months, 15 months or whatever. And I've, you know, in the last year I've opened like four of those. <laughs> uh, if you learning how to build your credit so that you can actually get accepted for that is a whole nother topic. I'll show you some sites that have some resources. Um, you, can, you can also earn cash back points and miles so that you're able to travel for free. So I generally travel on the bank's dime unless it's a business expense. And uh, I've made it so that my family visits our business, ex our business expenses too, because I put rental properties where my family lives. <laughs> so when I go to visit my rental property, yeah, I'm visiting grandma, sure. But <laughs> I'm also, you know, checking out my business. <laughs> so you can... Uh, there's tax benefits to doing that. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, if I would just want to take a trip to Hawaii, for example, you know, I'm going to try to make that as close to zero dollars as possible. And, the, you know, we've got pandemic right now, but if we accumulate all our points, then, you know, theoretically, all the borders open up again and we can spend those points. So right now I'm in the accumulation phase of, of points and miles. And if I didn't want to travel so much. I could just take those points and miles and pay myself back and take the cash that I'll get and go invest that. So what if points and miles are used to buy assets? I mentioned the velocity banking earlier uh, in this first half as an intermediary vehicle for debt acceleration. We're going to pay less interest if you keep the average daily balance low as a summary of that. And we can do manufactured spending, whole deal on how to do that so that we're able to pay off things that we normally can't pay with a swipe using the money that came from a credit card. So I do this on a semi, you know, regular basis where I'll go to the grocery store, I'll buy Visa gift cards. Sometimes they're on sale. So I actually end up making money just buying gift cards. <laughs> and then I'll, you know, activate a debit card pin on those and uh, redeem them or use them to purchase money orders that I'll deposit as checks. So now I have that check and I'll go pay the rent or whatever with that check, okay. And the main point of the credit 
uh, the velocity banking strategy is to keep your debt utilized. Debt, well, this is the main point. This is a separate point, actually. Your total credit limit, your credit score, how that's calculated is based on certain algorithms that prioritize you maintaining your utilization as low as possible. That means the more limits you have, don't spend it all, but the more limits you have, the more balance you can carry. So when I say $12,000, ideally don't, you know, don't max out a $15,000 credit limit. You know, I'd want to keep that under $5,000 in balance month over month. Otherwise it'll start to significantly impact. It's like exponentially decrease your credit score. So I'll try to keep that under. So if you got a hundred thousand dollar limit, Overall, then now you can borrow up to 30,000 on your credit limits uh, without significantly impacting your score. <clears throat> okay, so retirement accounts are another thing. Just checking on time here. 11, okay, good. So retirement accounts are, an, are another thing. We can, uh, you can use your own or other people's retirement accounts to invest in a business or real estate. And how do we do that? So, most people have retirement accounts. They're probably, you know, they're probably in index funds or, you know, Vanguard funds or Fidelity funds. They can't go and buy real estate with that. They can buy REITs, perhaps real estate investment trusts, but that's not the same thing as owning and controlling your own uh, investments. So what you can do is there's a, there's a tool called a self-directed retirement account. And you or someone with a, you know, with a retirement account, maybe your parents can borrow or withdraw Normally, if it wasn't 2020, it would be normally up to 50% or $50,000 at 5% interest rate. And that interest, 5% annually, is paid back into your own retirement account. So you're really not paying an interest. I mean, you're, you're paying it to yourself one, from one pocket to the other pocket. 2020, the CARES Act temporarily increased that to 100% or $100,000 with no payments for one year if you've been impacted by COVID-19. So asterisk, you know, everyone has been impacted by COVID-19. So, you know, take that as you will. Speak with your, or whoever's retirement account owners, um, HR, if they have one, or if it's an IRA, then you speak with a CPA and how to do that. And it's also tax-free if you pay it back in full within the five years. So it's not, it's not classified as a withdrawal. You can also withdraw a retirement account. There are certain, normally there are certain ex, uh, exemptions. If you're buying your own house, your primary residence, you can just withdraw that without a penalty anyway. But normally there's a penalty if you're not using it towards the down payment of your own house or some other qualified withdrawals like education, family, I believe a, a couple other things, medical expenses. So you expect a 10% penalty, but in 2020, they waive that completely. So you can use whatever your money for whatever. And annual, if you withdraw it, if it's a, from a traditional retirement account rather than a Roth one, the, generally that was pre-tax money, so the taxes will be due upon withdrawal. But the CARES Act allows the withdrawal of up to $100,000 with no, with no penalty, and they actually spread out the taxes over the next three years. So you can defer the taxes due over the next three years. If you pay it back in full, you get a tax refund at the end of each year or at the end of the three years. But if you don't pay back in full, then you, it's, it's classified as a withdrawal and you'll just pay the taxes at that point. And there are ways you know, strategically to say, oh, I wanna take it out this year because I'm not making any other income. So we can technically pay taxes or technically withdraw up to $12,000 standard deduction in 2020 and not pay any taxes on that because it's uh, treated as a, you know, a deduction. You can also pay your kids. <laughs> there's a whole other thing on that. And there's a rule of 55 that I'm just gonna touch upon, but if you're old for some reason, or if you know someone who is old, if they leave the, their employers after age 55, there's no penalty. So this is on a normal year, that's not 2020. You're able to do this anyway. And then I mentioned a self-directed retirement account. What we can do is we can actually take an existing retirement account, an IRA or an old 401k and roll it over into a self-directed one. That self-directed retirement account, there's only a few custodians Vanguard and Fidelity will not help you do this. There's a few, there's a handful of custodians that will let you, that will let you do this and will help you do this. And structure it in such a way that the IRA, the retirement account itself, is the owner, is, this, is the owner of an LLC. It's the sole owner of an LLC. Or it might be a partner owner of, a, of an LLC. The LLC has a bank account. The bank account is checkbook access to the LLC's funds and thus the retirement account's funds. So there's a whole cool thing where 
the LLC that the retirement account owns borrows from the retirement account, the cash. Now you've got a bank account with all the money in it. All the money has, there's, there's a lot of rules that go to do this, but all the money has to go back into that retirement account. And you can't, you, you can't like swing a hammer. Uh, that means you can't do active work on the property. You can manage it, but essentially you have to be as passive as possible because it's the retirement account that's generating and retirement accounts are supposed to be passive income. So it has to be, it has to stay passive. Otherwise there's tax implications. So let that season for a bit. Give me a second. I got to get a charger. Guys, the chat is still open. If you want to put any questions while Earl is talking and that way we can get to them when he gets to the end and we take some questions. So feel free to put those in there for now since we're a smaller group. I won't reach. <laughs> That's what happens when you're in a large space, Earl. Yeah, this house is too big. <laughs> is that the new property? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll just tell our friends here, Earl just recently closed on a very beautiful, very large uh, property um, in Colorado, right? Yeah. And um, it's amazing. It's bigger than practically any hotels you could think of at this moment. And so um, that's where he is now. And he did it using all of these strategies that he's talking about today. So um, I just think it's, it's wise for us to just listen up a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Marlene. Yeah, yeah, I've got, just looking out the window behind me, there's, we're at 8,700 feet in the Rockies and the views are just gorgeous. I don't even see, I mean, there's some neighbors, but I don't see them. <laughs> uh, we're turning this, uh, we've been working actively to turn this into a short-term rental as well. So this is not necessarily just a place to live in, but a place that makes money. Okay, so that's about that on retirement accounts. I'm going to check the chat here if there one, anyone got lost there. How difficult is it to maintain a property in a different state or city from where you live? The answer to that question, Travis, is that it, if you have the right systems in place, it's not at all difficult. I manage a long-term rental and a short-term rental in New York, in, in upstate New York, that, while I live in Denver or in Colorado in general. And... For the most part, if you've got systems in place, you've got boots on the ground, I've got family that I leverage quite a few times, then you're able to do this without necessarily tying yourself to that geography. So it's a concept of geographic arbitrage in that you can generate income in places that make sense using as little money as possible out of pocket and use that income to live where you want to live, right? You can still rent in New York City. You can still rent in expensive cities like LA, San Francisco, and Denver is one of them. But the rents that, that you're paying come from other rents elsewhere. And it doesn't have to be rents. I, I use that term loosely, but, but passive income in general. It could be a business. It could be, I don't know, vending machines, laundromats. It could be storage, storage units. It doesn't necessarily have to be real estate. You could be making money on YouTube. You know, there's different tax implications, but real estate, particularly long-term real estate, anything held more than one year is considered long-term by the IRS. That gives you the most tax benefits. It's not treated as active income. It's treated as passive income and there's no self-employment because it's not employment. Mm. So how do we use other people's money? <laughs> Let's say we have retirement accounts. Did you know there are 20, there's $28 trillion. Last I checked, there was $28 trillion sitting in US retirement accounts alone. That's not counting brokerages. That's not counting any of that. It's just qualified retirement accounts. There's $28 trillion. So the way we do that is we are going to ask, we're going to ask these questions to a potential lender or a potential equity partner. I didn't use the word investor because the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission regulates that term. But a lender or an equity partner is able to invest with you if you present an offer. 
Okay, you're not asking for money. You're never asking for money. You're presenting an offer. You're making an offer such that their returns are increased by investing with you versus leaving it in their retirement accounts. Okay, so here's the questions. Did you know you can use, I usually start off with, did you know you can use a retirement account to invest in real estate? So, hey, mom, hey, dad, did you know you can use a retirement account to invest in real estate? No? Well, let me show you this. But if you don't mind me asking, how much do you have in your retirement account? Without getting too much into your personal space, they might figure that out, they might not, you know, ballparks, estimates. If you don't have your own, you know someone who does, right? So it's not necessarily your retirement account. These are other people's. And let me ask you this. What kinds of returns are you currently getting on that retirement account? Do you know? Have you checked recently over the past five years at least? Is it, I don't know, 5%, 6%? If you're lucky or you're good and you don't touch it, it might be, get, it might be in the S&P 500. You might be making an average 7 to 9% annually. Okay. So let's just say out of 8% on average, some years might be down, some years might be up. So if I could show you how to get double digit returns on your investment, secured and insured by real estate, would you be open to having a conversation about investing with me? Yes? No? If they say no, no, like, no. All right. <laughs> That's all good. You know, I've been getting real, uh, I've been getting 20 plus 30 plus percent on just the cash flow from the cash that's invested in real estate. And then what you do is if they say yes and all that, you show them how self-directed retirement accounts work. You have to know how they work first, of course. But the, the main point is to roll it over from the retirement account into a self-directed IRA, or you can borrow or withdraw or leverage the CARES Act. So you take that money. Now they're not making 8%, 5%, whatever on the retirement account, but they're making it with you. So what if you present an offer that say, hey, hey, grandma, can I borrow from your retirement account and I'll pay you 15% interest, you know? And if I don't pay it back, well, then you can take my house because <laughs> I'm gonna use this money to buy a house, right? And chances are your, your grandma will probably let you borrow that money knowing that it's gonna come back with interest. 15%, 20%, the numbers are all up to you. If you just get double digit returns, maybe you can double or triple that. It really depends. Some, sometimes you can say like, oh, you got 5%. What if I can triple that? And they're like, oh, eyes what light up. Triple, my, triple, my, triple the money that I'm making on this retirement account. Sign me up. <laughs> so now that you know how to use your own or someone else's retirement account to invest in real estate, how much of that capital are you open to redeploying? Again, keywords here, redeploying, right? We're not spending it. <laughs> We're deploying it. So I don't know, they might say they had $200,000, but they're willing to give you 50,000 of that. So now you got 50,000. That's enough for a down payment on a small multifamily outside of New York City, for sure. So now you got this capital. Within one year, you pay it back from the profits or maybe, you know, sometimes if you're, if you're doing this properly and well enough, they're gonna say, keep the money. I <laughs> just give me, <laughs> you know, I don't wanna take that back because then I'll just go back to 5% you know, make, keep making 20% on it. So they might actually let you keep that money, not keep it, but keep it tra uh, trapped or locked up in the equity of the home as a down payment. But if you needed to pull it back out, increase the value of the property, pull out a home equity line of credit, cash out, pay your, pay your grandma back. Now you got a house that you own yourself. It's not free and clear. It's got a you know mortgage to it, or maybe it might have a line of credit to it, but the point is you've got an asset that generates income. The home equity line of credit, there's also B, B locks or E locks, which is business lines of credit. It doesn't necessarily have to be a home. You know, you can get home equity lines of credit on investment properties, for example. There's certain, there's a quite a handful of, of lenders that will let you do that. So it borrows, it's essentially, like I said, a credit, uh, a credit card tied to the, the value of your home or property. So you speak to your bankers, local banks, I got a whole list of them. Uh, that do particularly for investment properties. But if you've got a, a home that you live in, you can pretty much go with any bank, just find the best rates. Sometimes they have promos that are 0%, even more powerful. But it really doesn't matter what the interest rates are, as we saw earlier. Uh, there are, of course, requirements. There's 
nice things about lines of credit is that they generally cost less to to in closing costs than a than a mortgage. So a lot of the closing costs and fees are are much much smaller in cost. And we can use the velocity banking strategy. There's private funding. This is your private money fund. So uh, Melanie's asking, how how and how high is the risk, assuming you are banking, no pun intended, and always having tenants? This is related to the question from Travis about maintaining yes. property in a different city than where you are. Yes, and that's really, really good question as we're seeing nowadays, especially if you have long-term tenants that rely on their jobs and the jobs and the economy has tanked a little bit, then everyone all the way up along the line, the financial line to the banks are, are not, are, are seeing less reliable streams of income. So the question was, how, how are you always, like, how are you generating, or how are you calculating the risk really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's all, it's, there is risk of course, in every investment inv uh, involved. If it, if it was riskless, then it wouldn't be an investment, right? It would just be your savings account, I guess. And even the savings account, you're still risking, you're risking the money due to inflation. <laughs> uh, and you can't control that either. So there's always some sort of inherent risk. Stuffing your money in, a, in a, under your mattress is, is risky in the sense that it's not decreasing in dollar, but it's, it's decreasing, it's not decreasing in dollar amounts, but it's decreasing in value. So when it comes to properties or businesses that generate revenue and income, yes, you're going to have that risk. As long as you have cash reserves or credit line reserves you're able to you're able to hold off and stave off uh, and buy you enough time to pivot and perhaps change the business model up a bit then you're able to de-risk yourself so the more tools you have on your tool belt the more knowledge you have the more you're able to see oh this strategy is no longer working out how do we use the same assets to using a different strategy to generate, you know, to get back to the incomes that we were used to, or, or even, you know, at the very minimum break even cover the expenses so it can hold off until the, uh, until everything turns back around. So there's always like, you're, you're gonna wanna use, uh, use the calculator that I have to estimate conservatively. Let's say, what if, we only have, let's say we have a fourplex, right? What if we only have, you know, three of the units paying? What if we only have two of the units paying? Or let's say you have a short-term rental. What if your occupancy, people travel stopped and your occupancy drops to zero? Most people will say, oh, you know, let's, zero seems unthinkable. At least it did back in 2019. Zero percent travel, no way, right? But, <laughs> but now we're seeing, some people are seeing zero percent travel. Uh, I'm not, fortunately. Um, actually, uh, COVID hasn't really impacted my short-term rentals, so that's that's good, I guess. Uh, but you know, you got to be also the best, the best in your area and your market, in order to continue to have that uh, income from short-term rentals coming in. So, so conservatively, you know, if you're just starting off. It depends on your risk tolerance. So for me, I'm like, okay, 60% seems reasonable. 50% seems reasonable. Can we make the mortgage payment so that we don't lose the house with only 60% or 50% of the income? Um, and if the answer is no, well, then, then you probably want to find another property, honestly. <laughs> uh, or you uh, must be able to have a plan B, plan C. So actually, you don't necessarily have to to go straight into like, oh, this po can't possibly cash flow. Short-term rentals don't work. Well, let's go into long-term rentals. Long-term rentals don't go don't work. Well, okay, how about I don't know, college housing? How about how about housing for traveling nurses, doctors, corporate workers? You know, so many different ways. Um, what if we switch that up and turn it into an assisted living facility? One of which I also have. Uh, and go, you know, the Medicaid route. So I got income streams coming in from Medicaid on one of my properties that uh, doesn't matter what the economy does, Medicaid pays. <laughs> uh, there's also, you know, social services uh, housing or, you know, Section 8 housing where they're, I wouldn't say they're guaranteed, but they're, you know, much, 
much better streams. So you switch up the strategy, switch up the income stream. That's just for rentals in particular. If you're talking about, I don't know, a restaurant business, okay, how do we increase our takeout orders given that all of our space, uh, our, our dining spa uh, dining income has reduced? Or what other kinds of business, I don't know, throw it out there that we can think of that are struggling nowadays. What have they done? What have other people done to, to mitigate their losses, right? Or at least at the very minimum baseline level, just make the, pay, uh, make the payments, keep the expenses going. And maybe one, one of those is just like, okay, I'm just gonna go get another side hustle. Maybe I'll go DoorDash several times a week just so I can pay that mortgage, right? That you normally wouldn't have had to do. Um, but given that, you know, you're not collecting any incomes from that business or, or rents from the, from the properties, then, then you're going to have to do something else. So as long as you keep yourself open and flexible and are able to be adaptive, then the risk is, I wouldn't say it's zero, but it further, you know, you have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan Omega. <laughs> Worst case scenario, sell the house. <laughs> You always have that. It's still tangible, right? It's not like stocks. You, you know, market goes down. You sell it. You sell it at a massive loss, and that's it. But uh, real estate, you know, if you if it's if it's operating as a cash flowing business, then there's always a buyer for it, even if it's a private private buyer. So private funding was the last slide we went we we left off of. It's only a couple a couple left. And that's the FFF round, friends, family, friends, and fools. <laughs> this is the community members who believe in you. These are gifts and loans that, uh, or some of the offers that, you know, if you make an offer, you're not asking for money. It might be borrowing from a family member's retirement account, borrowing from their life insurance policy, for example. So you have to, have, everything has to be in writing. You should seek legal advice. You don't want to ruin a relationship just because you, you know, a, a deal went south, right? Uh, even if you're not necessarily out to, you know, lose their money, you definitely don't want to lose other people's money, but they should also understand that it is, of course, you know, there is risk involved. Um, so if you have everything in writing, then there's no confusion and you've got, it's like, just go right back to the agreement. Uh, what was I supposed to pay you at which schedule? When is this due? All of that has to be outlined. Okay. You've got life insurance policies that are your own or other people's. So it doesn't necessarily have to be your own. Um, they, they, might, they should have cash value on there, those most full life and permanent life policies, the details of which are in that specific policy's terms. So if you have additional questions, contact your insurance agent about that or you, your, your equity partners or your lender's insurance agent. Okay, so it might be a family member's or a friend's life insurance policy that you're working with. There's also, um, there's also institutional funding. There's a website called getfundedonline.com. Get fund, I'm gonna put it in the chat here because it's, uh, it's not sharing my, my slides, but there's a getfundedonline.com, creditnerds.com is also the same, not the same company, but the same business owners. Uh, I, one of my instructors is the co-founder of both of these companies. And what they do is they provide a free assessment uh, and as an independent third, third party, that provides a free assessment based on your credit. So you open this free trial so that they can uh, so that they can log in and see your credit report, and then and then from that data they're able to tell you how much credit limits they're able to get to get you. There is a small fee, things like ten percent up to five thousand dollars. So if they get you fifty thousand dollars in credit limits, but you'll pay five thousand. But if they get you a hundred thousand, you'll still pay five thousand. Um, I receive nothing if you use their services. I just like their company a lot. There's also, of course, a small business administration. So speak to your local college representative, credit union or bank, or local field center for entrepreneurship. <laughs> they have some SBA resources there. And personal and private loans that you can use that they may or may not be secured by anything, but and they'll be at a certain interest rate, but you know how to pay those down now. So... <laughs> What we've learned uh, just in this short time is that everyone is, I've got a picture of a chessboard here. So imagine a chessboard. Everyone is playing this game of chess, but no one knows the rules. So you got your chessboard and your checkers board are the same, right? But you got chess pieces and you're playing with checkers rules. So you're just moving your knight like diagonally. <laughs> 
And that's the analogy that I see, you know, is, is going on in today's financial situation and the average Americans um, financial literacy and, and knowledge, right? Just even something as simple, simple as how credit scores work and how they're calculated and how credit reports are, how debts are, are reported to credit bureaus, what credit bureaus are, all of that is just like so complicated for a lot of, a lot of people. So to choose your next move in this game of chess, the employee mindset individuals default systems what you've learned so far is that the W-2 is the most expensive way to pay taxes. Mortgages are one of the most expensive loans in existence. Checkings and savings accounts benefit only the banks. Accumulating save, accumulation saving strategies like retirement accounts are highly ineffective. Jobs are the least effective way to make money. They're great, right? You're trading time for money, but they're not necessarily the path to, to becoming wealthy. Like how many years will it take for you to save a million dollars from your job. Chances are not, you know, it's gonna take forever, a lifetime or just never gonna happen. And the wealthy are business owners and real estate investors. So they're able to decouple their income from their time. Thank you. And uh, my Facebook group and other stuff, I can put it in the chat since it's in a slide that is on here, but also Marlene will share the slides and the video recording. Yes, I'm gonna- With all of this information. So we are at two o'clock and I thank you so much, Earl, and everyone who has participated today for um, getting through the technical uh, difficulties between everybody. Um, and you will get uh, an email from me when I have this recording and the slides posted on our site. And we will have one more session for our, our Lunch and Learns um, next week on the 12th. And it's about how to how to use algorithms in your business and how your business process is an algorithm and if you've joined us before it's being hosted by azim hussein and that's going to be really interesting too um so thank you. Systems. <laughs> say that again business systems i introduced the idea of having systems but yeah definitely attend azim's azim's workshop on how to actually build those systems right <laughs> and then really go into that detail you know this is all about just starting off with the right mindsets and some of the tools in order to just hit the ball, you know, hit the ground running and get started. Yeah. So um, please, I hope you guys join us. Um, I appreciate your time today. I know today was a little bit longer than our usual. Next week will be 1230 to 130 Eastern time. And so um, I appreciate everyone. And thanks so much, Earl. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, Marlene. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.